So much online, but well, like, online's a facilitation. The bricks and mortar is where you bring it to life, really. Success for me is just fulfilling ambitions all the time. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Care of Business. My name is Paul Cheatham, and today I'm delighted to have with me Executive Chairman of JD Sports PLC, Mr. Peter Calgan. Hi. How are you doing, Pete? You okay? Yeah, very well, thanks. Thanks for doing this, folks. I know no you just problem. got off a flight. Yeah. From? Indianapolis, yeah. Right. Very good. Via right. Charles de Gaulle, which is the worst airport in the world. And you're going back tomorrow to? Spain. Spain. So today I'm going to ask you some questions, some a little bit about your earlier life, actually. I'm going to ask yeah. you a little bit about how you set up Cowgirls up, how yeah. you got into business for a start. Then obviously we'll ask you some stuff about JD and then the final bit that I guess we're interested in is why JD seems to be booking the trend of when everybody else is all doom yeah. and gloom about uh, High Street. You don't seem to be in the, in no. the last report. So no. so that's it. So if we go right back to, um, you were brought up, were you brought up around here? Are you in Manchester? I was brought up in a place called Kersley, which is, it was the lower end of Kersley, which was nearer Swinton and then Salford. So I went to school in Salford. Right. And at any point, and then you went on and you went to uni, I guess. So where did yeah, you what, what I did, I did maths, physics, and chemistry A yeah. level, and thought I want to do any, anything but maths, physics, or chemistry. Yeah. So uh, I thought I fancy this economics. I've never never read a book on economics or yeah. anything like that. I just yeah. thought it was a bit more business related. I'd skipped a year at school, so. I was too young to go to university. They wouldn't, a lot of universities wouldn't admit me straight away. So, so I had to apply a year in advance. Okay. Some wouldn't take you a year in advance. And uh, I landed the salubrious uh, Hull University, which actually is a very good university in fairness. And you did economics? Or? I did economics. With And at that point, did you think you was going to be an accountant? or? What I did, what I did was I did economics and the specialty was accountancy, um, so I did a, I was doing a degree with economics and accountancy, but then when I got into the accountancy, I found out a university so tedious that I decided I wanted to do business economics, and then I did two accountancy papers on top. Right. And at the time, the university said you can't do it, it's too much to take on because there were two main syllabuses. But what you find is if you like a subject, you're more likely to be successful with it yeah. than if you don't. Yeah. So I did the subjects that I wanted to, to do, and uh, yeah, I got 2 1, and at the end, they even offered me a position as a lecturer. At, at the university on on accounting, which right. when I look back, well, I knew when I left university, but I'd gone lecturing it, I knew about a 50th of what I know now. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, it would have been very strange because it would have been purely an academic exercise, sure. not not the practical. Yeah. So you left there and then you must have gotten a, a council training then course, I, I guess. Yeah, then I, uh, well, I was going to Ernst Young, and from the from the milk round at the university, that was where I decided I was going to go. And I went because I was so narrow minded, because of the way I'd been brought up. I yeah. mean, everything in life to me was pubs, clubs, and football, really. Yeah. And uh, I went to this place, and the first day they gave you the proverbial briefcase and then I looked on the wall and I was one of about 20 and it said you're going doing this audit for four months I think it was Whitbread or somewhere like that this is in Manchester is it yeah yeah, yeah. and I thought I'm not doing that <laughs> I thought me four months doing what are they doing yeah I went home and I never went back I went 
to I went to work in a boutique. Okay. A menswear boutique with a mate of mine. Um, went to the bank. I could have bought half of it for a thousand pounds. They wouldn't lend it me. And he retired when he was thirty five. So it was a bit of a bank. Yeah, it was yeah. a typical yeah. banking mentality at yeah. the time. Um, so after a year, I thought the wor- the worst thing was I was in this boutique and I was I was earning a lot of money by then. And uh, you was an owner of it then? No, no, no. no. I was on, com- but I was on commission yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was growing, so I was making a lot of dough. You know, I'd gone, it gone really well. I was so. Sort of, driving an MGB GT whereas yeah. I started off with a, like a Mini or something you know? yeah. and uh, he said to me one morning you need to dust them trousers down and I thought surely I'm better than that I can't spend yeah. this morning yeah. dusting trousers yeah. so I reapplied to Ern Chung who refused me immediately right. for, for the what I'd done the previous year so I went to a smaller firm that got in Stratford, Old Trafford, near the Theatre of Dreams, and uh, that got taken over by Wright Stevens and Lloyd, Did and Farrow, and then became BDO. Right. So I went right through the trip. So I ended up at BDO. Quite, went there, <coughs> when I went, the talk about arrogance. I said, "What's the quickest way you can qualify to be a chartered accountant? What's the shortest period from me starting to me qualifying?" And it was about two years, nine months. So I said, "Right, I'll start on the last day possible to be the shortest right. qualification yeah. to get." And that's what I did. So after about two years, nine months. Then they came in and offered me, they said, uh, right, you can be a senior manager. And you were an audit at this point, or? Yeah. Yeah. And general commercial, I was moving a bit more, I was more interested in the commercial side of it than just pure auditing. Then they said, you can be a senior manager in, and you'll be a partner in four years. And at the time, four years? And four you're years. Four years, I was about 25 then. <laughs> 24 I probably was, actually. Four years? I thought, I'm not waiting four years. So I saw an advert in the Manchester Evening News and it said, uh, finance director, much foreign travel. So I thought, that, that's me. Yeah. So I walk over and at the time, I'm on 2,000 a year. I get the job, and within nine months, I was on 10,000 a year and a BMW, right? So I thought, it was like it's in the jackpot. Needless to say, and it was very advanced, it was in point of sale computer terminals. This must be 1980 or something, I guess. It was, yeah, probably, I'd be, yeah, yeah, about 19. Probably a bit early, nine seventy eight, nineteen eighty. Then I, uh, I went there and I thought the auditor was a real, or their accountant was a real flash guy from Nottingham. Well, he, he seemed flash to me, or uh, a guy called Bob Holloway. So I thought, hmm, I fancy going working. So I went as a senior manager working for him in. Nottingham. So you gone from an FD out of practice back into practice? Back into practice. Yeah. And I went up there because <clears throat> the two guys that I was working for in who had this computer point of sale terminal, it got sold to Unilever anyway. But the they uh they were basically like the alcohol a lot. I used to go and work up in Pissed every okay. afternoon, really. Anyway, so I went back there. After a couple of years, I was picking up lots of new clients. He came to me and said, I'm going to jack in. Uh, and I'd just set up a small office in Bolton. 
And the reason I'd, offered it, I'd set up a small office in Bolton was that people were just knocking on my door. I was living in Bolton at the time. And I was coming home at weekends and people were knocking on the door, can you, can you do me accounts, yeah. can you do this and that. So then I, uh, I set up a small office and that was called Cowgill Holloway. And I was about 29 years of age then, or 30 or something, and uh, I set it up. And he, he then decides to go. So what I did was took over, yeah, I was about 28 actually. Yeah. I took over his side of the of the practice and sold it to a company called Hacker Young. Yeah. Hacker Young in Nottingham and I kept the ones I kept the clients who were south of Watford and in the northwest. So I had a nucleus of clients and then I had uh and I sold the ones in Nottingham. Yeah. Um, so you so had a team of how many? Was it just you in the Bolton office or a couple of you? Set it up with about three of us. Right. And I sold that practice. Not for, I had income coming in, base income coming in from the Nottingham practice, which gave us the stability. But what I'm when I set up in Bolton then, what, what happened was Hacker Young, I knew the senior partner, who was a 22 partner office at the time, and the reason they bought it, they only had the, they had a, a furniture company called Cavendish Woodhouse, which was a big audit for them. But they had no other real clients in Nottingham, right. so so sold <coughs> the Nottingham area to them. Then, what happened was I came came back to Bolton. He, the the senior partner of Hacker Young had said, "We're going to set up an office in Manchester." He didn't tell me this, and Peter Cowgill's going to head it up, and we think it'll be a great success. And I thought, well, if he wants me to do that for him, yeah. I'll, I'll do it myself. Yeah. So I went to Bolton because it was big fish, small pool, bigger than Manchester. So what I hadn't realised was that everybody had gone to Bolton school and wanted to hammer the hell out of you for being, for coming from a school in Salford. Right. It was very Bolton school driven, the professional circles at the time. And uh, I set up and it divided. What I realised, it divided. So I got none of the ex Bolton school clients. Yeah. But I got all the up and coming, and, and there was a lot of new talent, new entrepreneurialism. And I used to go into work and it, it would be into the office. And it'd be new client, new client, new client. It'd be three new clients a week for five years, probably. One of them would be pretty poor, one of them would be average, and one of them turns out to be pretty sure. good. So that that recycles, but after five years, it was really becoming strong. So as we were moving premises, expanding the premises. How many would you have had then working for you? After about five years, we probably had 25, yeah. 30 after, and then it's just grown yeah. and grown. I mean, Cowgills has got... Yeah, 200, is it? 200. Yeah. So it's it, it was always based on very strong commercial principles. You know, we were good at, good at tax, we were good at commercial planning. And it, it's based on that, the, the compliance was I thought everybody could do the compliance. I just, you know, I used to say line eight firms up against the wall, whoever does it cheaper is yeah, go yeah. with them, but but it was the it was the add ons that we gave. Yeah. So we were effectively like the finance directors of yeah. a small growing yeah. company. Yeah. And one of the one of the clients that came in was was J D Sports, which was at the time, Mosley Sports, a model shop, it was just starting. And one, I used one shop? They had a shop in, uh, they'd had a shop in Mosley, but they then opened a shop in Bury, and they were just opening a shop in the Arndale, which they wouldn't have got in today's world, because they wouldn't have had the covenant. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had to redo their accounts at the time, and we started getting very close, so I was advising them 
increasingly. Is this late eighties? Are we talking? Late, yeah. From mid eighties onwards, yeah, yeah. Um, and advised it them right up to the float, and then it it floated. So the the practice was expanding, was becoming really successful. Yeah. So JD was your biggest client. Now, JD right? was growing to be the biggest client. Yeah, yeah. and. So it was, we were going to float it on the stock exchange. I was the person who knew the most about it. Right. So I did the flow. And at the time, I kept a sort of consultancy role in What kind of value did it float? Uh, mm-hmm. 100, yeah. 150 million, yeah. something like that. Um, How many stores? At the time, 56. And had it grown to that organically or by acquiring? Organically. It. So it's all organic in the first. Yeah. So, so you, at that point, you're on the board of JD. It's guess. quite a simple dynamic. On the flow, I was a CFO. Yeah. So. Are you full time at this point, or are you doing a bit of Cowgill, a bit of thirty hours a week, okay. probably at JD, and the rest was Cowgill. Thirty hours, fifty hours at yeah, Cowgill. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then, we took it forward. We I used to. We, I had a different point of view than. Um, and John and Dave, so I left, and then the non-exec said, "Two thousand and one, you've got to yeah. stay." I left at the foot. Yeah, I I'll only be noticing really about, or oh, we we decided to part company about nineteen ninety eight first time. But the non-exec stepped in and said he's not going anywhere. So the second time I left was about two thousand and one. Um, we'd got the business rocking and rolling and then I left two years later they phoned me back up and said yeah. we've got a bit of an issue would you like to come and help yeah so yeah so I'm just going back so you've left there and I guess then you're thinking I'm just going to focus on cowgills I went back to when yeah. I left there because that's growing and went growing back and growing, to cowgills yeah. and did lot I set up a department called specialized services and it was really advisory on growing businesses. On we did quite a lot of forensic work. We did in divorce work, yeah. special the bits that are around the fringes of the practice. Yeah, yeah. So I set up the department doing that. And uh, how big's Cowgills in at this point? Because the, it's the night. I guess it's a pretty decent size at this point. By that time, we'd probably have had ninety staff, right. probably eighty, ninety. I would have thought. Yeah. Almost getting close to ten yeah, million turnover, yeah, I guess yeah, seven, eight million or something. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. So it's a decent living for you at that point. You're yeah, good, good money off good that. Living. And of course, if you do a corporate finance deal, you're effectively exactly. banking it, aren't you? Yeah. 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 So then there's a three years you're doing that, and then or two years, and then they come back in. Come back in, say we've got a bit of an issue, which they did have. So I come back here, and will you come back? I say yeah, but I'm only coming back as the boss. So I came back and I got a phone call from the bank that said, um, you better come down and see us. And it was more serious than I thought. So they said, you've got two weeks to tell us how you're gonna turn it around and you've got, you've got four weeks to tell seven banks how you're gonna turn it around. So I stood at the end of the table the market now is at this point. Plan. Is the market cap going down? Share price going down? Did the market now? Share price this? was, um, yeah, the share price had gone. When I when I left, it had been say three thirty. The share price was one right. fifty or something like yeah. that. Right. So so I go back in, and then I start sorting it out, and then. Two founders decided they wanted to offload. Stephen Rubin brought a bigger percentage. He bought in at this is Pantman Group, is it? Yeah, yeah. two eleven. Um, I'd spent my time telling him everything that was wrong with the business. He made a decision in about three hours that he was going to buy controlling interest, and he went ahead and did that. And that that was what that was the beginning of. So at that time we were probably, well we were, we were valued at just under 100 million and uh, 
we that was on the basis really that was overvalued you yeah. know the stock provisions were pretty low the yeah. it was on its way down really at that point so you go you're going back in um do you leave Cowgills then? No, you don't leave Cowgills. I mean, you're still associated with Cowgills. Right. It's your name at the yeah. end of the day, and you do. Yeah. But, but did kind of your core the, activity the guys, switch? The guys, we had developed some very good partners, and they were increasingly taking a, 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 an increased level of interest yeah. in the business. Yeah. And, and what happens is, you find with a client, if you can have, you can have, an hour of my time or eight hours of somebody else's time whereas they might not at the beginning feel that that guy's quite as good Changes. he gets eight hours rather than one hour he's gonna he yeah. goes with that and there's a natural um migration of the client to yeah to the new partners yeah. and it, it worked great and they, they, they're really good and and it's worked really well it didn't scare you at all to go from what you was controlling in effect, and which was, a, in, in relative terms, a small business, wasn't it? It was nimble, yeah. flexible, do whatever you yeah. want. And as I yeah. say, if you to do a deal and get this. half a million quid, it hits the bottom line. And yeah, that's right. Your money. Um, did it not phase you, scare you, what, excite you? Yeah. What, what was your feeling? No, I thought, at the time, I remember thinking it's unfinished business. The, the issue is, when I first... Because where you are at that point is where I am today. There's right. interesting, we're at 100 staff, similar yeah. turnovers, it's an interesting yeah. point. So, so when, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the issues that did, I started to realise that the accounts, that there were insufficient stock provisions really, and uh, I was pretty pally with one of the guys on the bank syndicate, I still am, um, a guy called Dave Allenson, who was at Lloyd's, he's recently retired, and I, I, I said to him, I could do with going back and putting some provisions into these accounts because it's unfair me carrying the burden. He said, "I think they'll pull the rug if they do if you okay. do that." So I listened to his advice, which was good advice, and carried it like a hump on my back for a year. And we traded through it, and that's yeah, unusual. The rest isn't it? Is what you usually do is go in and you go in straight away, don't you? And say all that is not mine. But kitchens, yes, everybody, yeah. ki- and the, they normally over kitchens, <laughs> yes, it, actually, course, yeah. so they always look good. But no. Yeah, you had to carry it. I had to carry it, yeah. But you're full time then with. Um, yeah. 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 And so when you've told. And them it became what, increasingly. And it, what happened was really the the commitment, the commitment to Cowgirls in terms of time spent declined and the commitment here increased. Yeah. So if you, I've always worked maybe. 60 hours a week or something <coughs> and it just became from it being 30 30 yeah, then yeah. becomes 40 20 yeah. and 50 10 doesn't it yeah so what did you tell him you was going to do what was your plan when you went in you had a clear plan oh yeah, yeah. increase there were there were various points increasing accountability um empowering people with greater information Increase own brand at the time in textiles. Um, improve supply terms. Was he selling any own brand stuff in them days? Or yeah, it? yeah, but but not. We we just increased it. Yeah. We, you know, we yeah. we took. Yeah. We we improved the textile trade mainly. Yeah. So that that was there were a number of issues and they came off so. Slowly but surely, the increase. Yeah. I think the first year we made say thirteen million. Then we made. 25 I remember yeah. that and then 47 yeah and it went up from that and you did you did you I don't know how many staff you had then but you've gone from having 200 staff or 150 staff I guess to having yeah, a few thousand 20,000 yeah, yeah but then more. what was there well when you took yeah there, there will have been when I actually came back there'll have been about I would think six or seven thousand. Yeah, and it didn't phase you that at all. No. Do you think there's a massive difference between running an outfit where you've got two, three hundred staff to run in? Is is there that big a difference as what you'd think? Or it's a bit be, the difference between being in a council practice and really yeah. and this is yeah. that when you're in a council, you're sort of getting rewarded for your own input, your own efforts. 
hey, you've got to, you've got to pull the, you've got to work on the leaders who then have to work on the staff. Yeah. You have to work at a different yeah. level, really. Yeah. Yeah. That's the difference. And so you, 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 you went, you grew organically, then you started acquiring brands, didn't you? So yeah, I think well, you started acquiring retailers and brands, I guess, did you? Yeah. The first, the first breakthrough was really we bought all sports. Yeah. That was going into admin. Yeah. And that was a pretty big, difficult swallow at the time. It wasn't, in today's values, it was, it was about 13 million. It wasn't, it wasn't a big number. Yeah. At that time, they had about 180 stores that we had to manage the, the sort of integration of, not keep it, we only kept about 30 or 40, but we had to really manage it in, and that was quite a big swallow, but, but well worthwhile because it basically took a competitor out of the market. Yeah. The market was over distributed, really, and that that helped quite a bit. How long did it take to bed it in? 12 months, 15 months. But what, what happened was it initially, when you take a, a business over, sometimes the, the stores go backwards at the beginning because the, the, the customers that are going there, they expect a certain type of store and you're not that type of store so there's a bit you know in places I remember the, the sort of places all sports were where we weren't were places like Castleford or okay, yeah. Walked or yeah. places like that the smaller sort of places and they they served a different type of consumer in the sense they'd have yeah. a couple of tennis rackets and things like that. It's like Harrogate. You always got independence in there, right? but right. even they're even yeah. they're falling off. Exactly. Right? You know, it's similar. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, and in was was the goal in them days? Was it chasing market share, growth, profit? What was you looking for? A common. It's a it's a funny game we're in. Really, it's like playing chess. Really, it's. Uh, you you look at your importance to the brands. It was it was really always profit focused, but it was taking advantage of really profitable growth opportunity. Yeah, and there was a lot of that by driving your own brands in rather than no, not no. It, it was a combination. We we looked at things like say, I closed. In my first three years, I closed 105 stores that were, that were cannibalising other stores. So they were too, they were cl- too close together. Yeah. Right, so it's all sorts of management. Yeah. It's across the piece, really. It's like store design. As I say, I used to look at the old... I spent three years going through slow-moving stock and on it all the time, yeah. what margin are we yeah. getting at, we needed plans of how we'll get an out of it. There was a lot of detail went into it. Yeah. And was it was there a conscious effort to move away from I don't like sports sport to streetwear. I mean oh, you don't yeah. have you know Yeah, there'd always been Yeah. J D had really always been away from it to a degree. Oh, it right. just became and that was where all, all sports had become a casualty of being sandwiched. At the time between JJB and ourselves, yeah, yeah. so they were they weren't as trendy as JD, and they weren't as able to offer the same width of offering as JJB. Okay, so they got a bit sandwiched. Yeah, we were never, you know, we'd stop selling darts and ping yeah. pongs yeah, yeah. and tennis, yeah. table tennis bats yeah. quite a long time ago. Yeah. In 2014, you went from being chairman to exec chairman. Is that right? No, I was always exec chairman. Oh, was you? I came back as exec chairman. Yeah. Oh, right, okay. I thought there was a switch there. No. All right, so you've... Okay. I've but always been exec chairman. You, did you, you, you got a CEO today? In 2014, probably the CEO he left departed, the thing, yeah. so, and I didn't replace him. Okay, okay. So I took on, effectively, both roles, which... Yeah. The city frown upon it, but, yeah. but actually... In our game, it's probably the most successful yeah. way to be. Yeah. Do they still frown upon it? They, they frown upon. They don't frown upon anything that makes some money. But yeah. the, the the corporate governance end, you're supposed to have split responsibility. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. And l- the last, I don't know how many years it's been now, but you've been expanding outside of the UK. Yeah, Europe at the beginning was a was a big ask. We, this business was quite insular at the beginning. So, you know, what the hell are you doing going out France? What I did was pick up in certain brand conversations that I, I felt they were becoming more pan-European. Yeah. So we acquired a small business in France thinking we'll, we'd expand them. Yeah. But actually what we did was leverage it to open JDs. The JD, we've still got that that particular acquisition, which was called Show Sport. Seemed a lot of money at the time. We paid eight million, you know. We, right, yeah. We thought it was a big deal. And again, we had teething problems. Um, but then we started opening JD's France and using some of their infrastructure, some of ours. That's been really successful. Yeah. And then we did, I think we probably did Spain was my next acquisition. A company called Sprinter. It's proved to be one of the best ones I've done. How many stores was was that? At the time, they had about sixty, and they were a bit fearful of decathlon. How many now? Well, we've done an acquisition through them into Portugal. They've got about two hundred and fifty. Right. So So you're not you're not really going there. That's where that's where I'm going tomorrow night. (laughs) (laughs) So you go into them and expand them. You're not really going into them and closing them down. Like I'm going there to expand them. Yeah. And and to leverage. They're a really strong family, the, the the family that run it really live and breathe it and therefore they learn very quickly and well, hopefully we develop some techniques that they followed and they, we open the JDs in partnership with them in Spain oh, okay. and, the, and they've been good. Yeah, and you've just done America. I'm just in America. So America was a big swallow, you couldn't enter America, you, there's a lot of politics in, in sport distribution, so we couldn't have opened in America. Sure. Even, even though the brands wanted us to go into America, we couldn't open there. Who are the big players out there? Is it Foot Locker? Oh, it's Foot Locker. Yeah. Foot Locker and Dix. Yeah, of course. Are the, yeah. main, are the main two that the brands. Yeah. And so we couldn't have opened. Finish Line was the other one. So it's yeah. Foot Locker, Finish yeah. Line, and yeah. Dix, right? Yeah. So. So the, we, we looked at a couple of small acquisitions and the brands were saying that's not going to do anything for you because we're not going to let you expand it. Right. So it really pointed towards making a finish line acquisition. I knew the guys from there from various conferences and what have you. We spent a bit of time talking about the possibilities and then we decided to have a go. Right. It's the biggest... It's the biggest sport athlete, athletic market in the world yeah. all the brands are based there so you, you get closer to it by virtue of being there yeah and now you've got the Far East I think you've just opened in Singapore you've got Singapore yeah, yeah we, we've you've done got, that in between then we've done have you done Singapore Malaysia's, you've not bought there you've just done no I bought in Malaysia at the beginning I bought a joint venture uh, we're just resolving it now for for us to be 80% uh, did Malaysia first, then we did Australia, then we did Singapore, then we did Korea, and then we're doing Thailand next. And as the team's growing, you must, you can't, you, there must be so many touch points. How do you control how many people you actually liaise with that gets your message down to 40,000 staff? How many people will feed into you? Is it 20, 40, 10? What is it? It's a different emphasis, yeah. isn't it? At different points in time. Yeah. I have a leadership team. Yeah. That's very strong. That I have a lot of debates with. Uh, maybe eight people on it. Yeah. Then I have an outer leadership team, which probably is another twelve. And then I, uh, and then I'll deal with the individual subsidiary heads. Yeah. So I'll have a chat with a guy in Australia, I'll have a chat with a guy in Korea, I'll have a chat with a guy in... Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. spend some time over... The US is a new acquisition, so I'll spend a bit of time over there looking yeah. at that. And you just posted half-year results, which are record results. Yeah. They've we've had it, we've had Record it. results for the past hour, many. I know. Yeah. They always seem so to that's, be... So that's it. We've got to keep driving, haven't we? Yeah. but the, And in, in it, you talk about, like, the high street's important to you. 
And in every other one you pick up, the ice streak's dead. Yeah, I know. It's what's the what's the I reason think, behind? I that? think you can only convey the feeling of a business in. You can do so much online. Well, like online's a facilitation. Yeah. The bricks and mortar is where you bring it to life, really. If you if you walk into a store, you get a feel about it, everything like that. I'd like to think there's a place for both. It's I think I think rents will decrease because yeah, inevitably there's erosion. From yeah, yeah, the, from yeah. from online, you know, yeah. and and you've got to go where the footfall is. So we we do both, and we try and integrate the two. So we have it that you can pick up in store, you can order in store, and and have it shipped to your house. Yeah, yeah. We we try and make it a. Seamless but it does seem possible. to make sense if you're walking past the JD and you can browse in. When you when you sat on your laptop on a Saturday afternoon, you're going to buy yeah, from know. JD. Correct. But nobody else seems to be able to make that move. I mean, I think on, I think misguided time. tried it, and I don't no. think that's worked. It's not, has it? No. Um, and you look at even I don't know the Boots or Asos and that they don't seem to want to get into, into it. That. But, no, but so uh, it's, it just seems to be you guys making that. Dual yeah, I think we came, work. don't forget we came from a bricks and mortar background. Yeah. None of those others did, yeah. so we've had to develop online yeah. from a bricks yeah. and mortar background, whereas they haven't. And I think uh, we understand that. Yeah. We understand that dynamic yeah. quite well. How do you think it's? Do you, you think there is going to be a resurgence on the high street because of lower rents or? Can you see them staying uh, empty? How, how does I think that work? They'll end up, I think most high streets, high streets that are, unless the epicenters, as it yeah. were, I think they'll become more service oriented because yeah. you can't, yeah. you can't buy an echo on the internet, can yeah. you? Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So. Yeah. You can't groom your dog on the internet. No. Fair enough. And the indies in the boutiques, you, you, you think there's a place for them? Or are they, cause there is in terms of, there's always, a, as long as they, they need to deal with less mainstream brands because they need to be a bit more niche. Yeah. And I think they can be influencers. I think there's a place. But the problem is it's very difficult to scale it. Yeah. Of course. So they yeah. tend to be... Yeah. These days, it tends to be it's a couple a of stores and a little online yeah, yeah, back back of house yeah. session, yeah, yeah. And so for you, you do you said you do sixty hours, but it seems like it's a lot more than sixty hours. What keeps you going? What keeps you? What keeps the drive? Uh, I often ask myself that. Really, it's I think it's uh, it starts off with insecurity. I don't know about you, but it starts off with insecurity. Yeah. Really, I think. Yeah. You see an opportunity to make a few quid that you've never had, yeah. And you think I'll, yeah, I'll grab this yeah. because I might never have it again in yeah, the future. Yeah. So yeah. You, you have a go at that, and you probably get on the drug a bit, yeah. And then you have a fear of losing it. If and then <laughs> and then you become, as I say, I would describe it honestly. I've had to assess it. I think you go on a drug. I think it's just like being an alcoholic yeah. or anything like that. Yeah. And it's it's being driven. To the to the ultimate extent. Yeah. It's not something you actually. I regret to say, I don't think it's something you necessarily control that well. I think yeah. it controls you really. Yeah. Yeah. You've got the foundation here. Is that a big driver? Because obviously I've yeah. been I've seen yeah. firsthand even with whether it's up yeah. and coming young boxers that year yeah, or it's right. um, the once upon a smile. You you're constantly giving out. That must be. I mean, we do it in Sajulo, right? On yeah. a ridiculously low level compared yeah. to you, but nevertheless, you still see that infiltrate yeah. the community, and it's a big. It's, it's a big deal, here, though. Yeah. There's a lot. Of, yeah. It bonds a lot of people together, and we know it goes to good causes, and we tend to focus it on, on mainly youth associated yeah. charities that that you know underprivileged. Etc. That that we feel that identify with our overall ethos, really. Yeah. What does success look like to you? Because I remember twenty five grand a year was success to me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. That so that I remember that, and then you want to get a million quid business, but are you ever what What does success look like to you? I mean, when you started Cowgirls, what can you remember what it looked like? I tell you what I thought when I started Cowgirls. I thought I've got an opportunity here. And I thought, I'll be able to retire when I'm 40. But I, I had it in my mind yeah. that it was either fast burn or slow burn. As long as I'm 
and I thought I've got an opportunity of fast burn which meant if I really go at it I'll make a few quid and I'll be alright because I do not want in my head yeah a 60 year old accountant yeah was still pen pushing as it were and it and it he, yeah. he was no longer what the hell is it was so boring it was un, untrue what's he doing it so I I grasped the opportunity because of all the new clients that were coming yeah. in I grabbed it and uh, what I didn't realise is because you're on the drug by the time you get to 40 you've changed I'm not playing football as much right that was the biggest starter so you think when you go in it and you're 28 I'm still playing lots of football right yeah so I think I'll grab this opportunity and when I'm 40 I'll play lots of football what you don't realise is you're not quite as good as you were when you were 28 and it goes downhill from there as well by the way yeah so I success for me is just fulfilling ambitions all the time it's sin to be honest they're not numerical anymore it's making sure you know I remember my mum and dad and, and quite a few people who know me know this having a fight in the kitchen over a Kit Kat yeah right yeah and I remember thinking, I ain't fighting over a Kit Kat. And when I mean fighting, I mean a carving knife versus right. a kitchen <laughs> toasting fork, right? Yeah. And it was over a Kit Kat, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, well, there must be a better life than yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And hopefully, you know, I've been able to provide that. Yeah. And what I believe is, if, you, if you're talented and you work hard, then the money follows it. Yeah. And, and now, really, the money... Is a byproduct. I think. I, I think I deserve. It's a measure. Yeah. So you think you deserve it. Yeah. But course. it ain't the main. It ain't the main goal. Do you ever? Do you ever kind of live in the moment and look at what you're doing and reflect, or you just always? Oh, it like Roy Keane, where you win the league and you just go in the change rooms and get ready for the next year. Yeah. Is is that how you are, it's, or do you ever it's, reflect? It's a, no. It's it's get. I'm more like Roy Keane in that respect. Yeah. 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 I don't. You, I don't. There's occasions where you think you've got to get off this drug, boy. You yeah. know there is, there is, yeah. but when you've got when you, you know, there's no excuses. I've built the beast here, so yeah, I've got what I deserve really as well. Yeah, you've had the success, but yeah. you've got the pain that comes with it. Yeah, and the stress, you, the stress of the job, you've always Just, been able to handle it. Yeah, you like but, the pressure. But, yeah, but don't think I ever wake up any morning feeling anything other than a little bit of anxiety. I yeah. don't know how you are, but I, exactly every, every morning that, yeah. I wake up, yeah. you're facing a problem, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. But that's never phased you? No. No. It, it doesn't fa- I mean, sometimes I get... Have you had to learn to live with that? Has it yeah. bothered you more in the past as when you grew into it or you just thought, fuck no, it, I'm I've just always had it. it. It's just been at different levels, I suppose. Yeah. Because you grow into it a bit, I suppose the, the scale of the issues at... at yeah now yeah. are far greater than than they probably previously were but at the time they felt they feel the same now as they felt then yeah just a different level yeah everybody has their anxieties yeah. don't they yeah oh yeah yeah people think the if more you successful you are that they'll go away but yeah, the drop's no, bigger the no, fear of that drops yeah, just, just a bigger drop in it and, and i don't care what anybody says anybody who's successful has got a level of ego as well yeah. a level of pride a level of ambition they're all mixed together, a level of insecurity. You, you don't actually know how to pull them apart, but but probably from a very early age, probably, I think I always wanted to be somebody rather than nobody, you know. Yeah. When I was 10 years of age, I remember, and I look back on this and think, what, what happened was, the sports teacher in the junior school not only took me to one side, I picked the team. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it wasn't, he didn't pick the team, I picked the team yeah. From, the, yeah. from the front of the class. Yeah. Now that's somebody who probably, he's probably got certain ambitions and yeah. leadership yeah. qualities at that age, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise you wouldn't have it, would you? Exactly. And work-life balance, how do you do it? And a question I'm going to ask you, because... If, you didn't have a, if, it, if you've not got the support at home, you can't do it. No. You know, if you, if you haven't. No. 
like you say, you you was you've you've just had to make a call to say I'm coming I, back from America, coming to Spain tomorrow. I didn't even know until I was coming back from America that I was got. It's been booked, yeah. but I don't look that far ahead yeah. to say yeah. I'll be going. Yeah. And it, it's always been the case that you've got to be able to go home and say I need to change my shirt. I'm out tonight. Yeah. You can't have a situation that you, yeah. you know your egg on toast. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Over your head. I've got a throw. <laughs> Although I do remember one throw. <laughs> but because uh, I have a tendency to go to the pub as well uh, to relieve it. And uh, yeah. I remember somebody standing up with me and saying, The dinner's in the dog. <laughs> Peter, yeah. your dinner's in the dog. Yeah. Football, you're big into your football, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Two big teams in Manchester City yeah, and Bury. No, Which one, one is it? There's only one. Big, <laughs> there's only one big team in Manchester. Yeah, yeah. You're a big United fan. Yeah. You go to most games, don't you? Yeah. yeah. What do you think of them at Every the moment? Uh, I think. I think they're in the position in the league they deserve to be. I think the yeah. mediocre. I think. Yeah. I don't think they blended. I think they've got probably better players than than where they are yeah so I've got reservations about there's a lot of whether... criticism at the club isn't there but the, there's a club changed dramatically I don't know or is it just that cyclic thing well, of a Liverpool I mean, the, United I suppose the difference is that Fergie you, I'd love to have been David yeah. Gill if you if you yeah, if, you, exactly. if you're chief exec and you're managing and, and you're running a club behind Ferguson yeah you, it, it's a lot easier than it running it behind somebody Who's bottom of the league, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So I always say that, you know, if you're going to be chief executive of a football club, if the manager's successful, yeah. you know, I remember at Bolton, Phil Garside looked like he was wonder boy because he was sat behind Sam Allardyce. Yeah. yeah. As soon yeah. as Sam went, everybody's throwing bricks at, <clears throat> at Phil Garside. He's not such a great winner anymore. Sure. But, and I, I think the same with Fergie, but, you know, if I can go and have that job and I sit behind Fergus and I'll be happy. Yeah. <coughs> so last question now. You mentioned um, Fergie. He went on till he was seventy odd. Yeah. How you long don't, am I going to carry on? You don't seem any. You're not slowing down. How, how long anyway. am I going to carry on? What is what is it for you? What is what's next for till JD? I'm ninety. Then? Is it? No, I'm not. I don't. So you can get off the drug. You never know until I can get off the drug. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Something will tell you when it's time to get off the drug. Yeah. But. You'd also say in this game, it's like being a Premiership manager. You only last a certain period of time. I've, I've outstayed my welcome already. <laughs> yeah. That's it. All right. So really, Come I really on. appreciate it. I know how busy exactly. you are. So yeah, no, it's brilliant. Thank good, you very much for you. that. I don't think I've done it for you. You know that. Yeah, no. Thank you very right. much.